How's it going, hey, baby? Hey, how Good. How are you, man? Yeah, very good, thanks. Good. Gareth? Yeah, I'm Gareth. Yeah, yeah. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, you too, man. <laughs> Great to meet you, man. Really excited to chat to you today. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, looking good. You got the scarf working like a charm, it seems. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not too difficult. Good stuff. All right, yeah, good stuff. So, um, yeah, man, thanks for coming on today. We're going to um, just run through a few things now, like just to let you know, like, basically how it all works. And Anyway, it's not, I mean. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you did it now. I was like, hang on, when you went close. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was like, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what happens. I don't think we've ever had a, a chat in, since we've been doing this that there hasn't been, like, some weird something with Skype at some stage, like. <laughs> with someone, with one person, it's this; the other person, it's that. <laughs> Crazy. So where are you now, anyway? Are you at home, or are you? Yeah, I'm at home in the uh, in the bedroom. So okay, cool. family's up there. Nice one. <laughs> uh, looking at the ocean, uh, uh, ready for the fireworks tonight. Ah, uh, what's the oh, occasion? Oh yeah, forgot about that. Yeah, it's so, a yeah, competition. Uh, they have this competition for fireworks. So I'm just looking at all the boats out there. The waves rolling in. Happy days. Uh, and then I'm the sorry time. about that, but. No. The light blue. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's fine. Light's really cool. good now, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect, perfect now. It's, it's a little bedside lamp. I've got two on. It's classic. It's perfect. No, it's perfect. It worked out well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's no issue. The cool, yeah, yeah. But that's the cool thing about it is that it's not live. So if anything does happen like that, it's not an issue. You know, it all just gets edited The magic out. of editing. It'll be like, oh, didn't see that ever happen. <laughs> yeah. It didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Enjoy your fireworks tonight, Andy. And, and thanks again, really. We really had a great chat. Like, I think people are going to really enjoy this one a lot. So mm. um, I really do appreciate your time. Uh, well, we both do, obviously. So. Go, go head out there and don't miss your fireworks. <laughs> I think it's about the start. That's what the phone call was with the guys are going, oh, are you coming up for dinner? And uh, I think it's about the start. I can hear something going on. Okay, mate. Right, well, good luck. Cool, man. No, All right. Right. Good. Sure, guys. <laughs> Thanks. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Eh? Take care, man. Yeah. Good to speak to you, bud. You. Cheers, man. Okay, bye. See ya. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot, man. Yes. Wow, we... Um, I felt pretty like I got a lump in my throat at one stage. Like there was a moment when I was just listening to him, like, and I was just really like engaged in what he was saying, and I, like, I felt this deep sorrow, like, uh, like, you know, with his son and him, and it really like it touched me a bit, you know. She's, but it must be so tough. I, I can't even begin to think what it must be like for him, you know. Like, he's a super strong guy, you can see, yeah. you know, and like. It just must, it must like just pull him. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know what the yes. right analogy or whatever it is. No, like, I know what you mean, bud. Yes. Man. And, and it's, it must take so much for him to, to open up and talk about this. You know what yes. I mean? Like, and. It's hard. Yes. So it's the male hard. ego. Right? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But seriously, like, what a flipping cool guy, man. Like, what a, yeah, yes. what a good bloke. You know what I mean? You'd like. You know you can have a, a great relationship with that sort of guy because there would be no cuck. At the same yeah, time, totally he's he's right. he's like now he's like quite open to kind of you know um, yeah. maybe a bit more than he might have been in the past. Totally, and yeah. He would just be like a cool guy, you know. He, he's yeah. Uh, yeah, with with so much knowledge to impart. You know what I mean? Like yes, but yes, this is so cool, eh? Yes. Yeah, man. Thanks for setting that up, bud. It was really good. No, of course, but No, it's cute fun, man. No, definitely. I definitely want to go and have like a, like a, like go do one of those sessions with them. And yeah, yeah, really yeah. No, that would be cool. Yes. That would be good for you to do that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, actually, actually, that would be a good one for like Insta or something yeah, as well. Like, yeah, 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 but very good. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's Kiff, man. So, what did, what did you think? Did you think it was a good chat? I really liked it have... a lot, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked yeah. it so much. Um, I liked him a lot. That's the thing, you know. Um, yeah. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. What's up, Gareth? <laughs> Great guys. How's it going, my man? <laughs> um, awesome, my man. How about you? Yeah, awesome. Thanks, bud. Awesome. Flipping hot in London at the moment. It's just like <laughs> the most incredible spell of hot weather I've ever had for with 19 years of being here it's like it's just so cool i love it <laughs> yes. and now you're thinking about leaving there at some stage <laughs> yeah i know tell me about it but uh but i must uh, always remind myself that winter is very close by and uh, it does get cold and i mustn't forget that that happens <laughs> it's always looming isn't it just around the corner <laughs> exactly but and it's long <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So how about yeah, you? How's your day? Uh, yeah, great, man. I'm really excited to get into t- today's chat. Uh, we had a chat to a gentleman named Andrew Roberts. He's an ex-military man, uh, 30 years experience in the Australian Army. He's uh, also been a trainer for uh, the Afghanistan National Army uh, Officer Academy, and he was the head mentor for um, the young officers and trainer there. And he was also an instructor for new recruits uh, in, uh, in the Army. And he also runs a free community fitness boot camp. Um, he's one of the, the trainers there. So he does that uh, out of the goodness of his heart. And he's also, um, very importantly, a domestic violence victim and uh, has uh, an amazing uh, tale to tell about that. Yeah, he does for sure. And um, it's definitely one of the most moving podcasts I've ever been involved in, that's for sure. So in terms of uh, you know the topics that we cover on the podcast, we do talk uh, about his boot camps that he runs um, and the, the right mindset around training. Uh, we, we touch on uh, all the lessons that he's learned uh, from his days in the military, uh, his uh, thoughts on uh, mandatory service and our thoughts too, actually, we discuss that a fair bit. Um, we also find out you know, about his military career because he was there for 30 years and you know, he touches on, on war uh, which is also really interesting and on obviously serving your country. Um, we get on to the domestic abuse and we talk about that for a really good amount of time. It's um, very touching um, and a very important topic. And then, uh, you know, the difficulties around being a man who is uh, domestically abused and then, um, you know, just opening up and actually speaking about it. So we cover a lot of things. Um, it's a, an amazing podcast, if I say so. Uh, it hits Craig and I a lot for uh, a long time afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we look forward to hearing what people's thoughts are on it. Just in terms of uh, a bit of the housekeeping. So uh, we're starting a, a kind of a new feature on our, on our website and also we'll post it on social media and stuff is we're gonna do a featured listener. Uh, so each week we want to feature one of our listeners because we always get such cool feedback from people and you know we have like our sort of uh, raving fans I guess that um, you know always give us great feedback and part of what we like to do is we try, we're trying to like build a nice community you know we have there's so many amazing people in this world that are doing awesome things and uh, we just want to sort of build that out and you know just connect people so that's uh that's one of the things that we're, we're aiming on doing in the future and well, well as of luck from i guess in the next couple of weeks for sure we, we're looking forward to getting to know you guys uh more and uh as well as with each other you know like there's so much that we can do together we can you know gareth and i talk about collaboration a fair amount and um it's just nice to know what you guys are up to and uh and who you are and uh yeah, um, get get to know each other a bit better. So that's really exciting. Um, just in terms of today's chat, um, the audio was a little bit echoey, um, but I'm pretty sure you'll acclimatize to that once you've listened for a few minutes, so it's no big deal. And uh, I must say we are very grateful uh, because my Mac, uh, as you may have seen on our social media, was uh, down for the count. And as anyone will know, that's when things are functioning well, you don't really think about it. And the day you wake up and turn it on and it doesn't work, it's like uh, <laughs> your world comes to an, a little end. And uh, so we ran a little bit behind on launching uh, Simon van Gent's podcast. But, uh, you know, as Gareth said as well, the sun still uh, rises in the morning and the earth still turns. So, <laughs> you know, it's all good. <laughs> and we just thank everybody for their support. It was, it was really good. And, uh, it's a, it was a good exercise in uh, my and our little um, mental toughness and a little bit of late nights and a bit of resilience. Um, but uh, let me tell you, it's got it's nothing uh, compared to what our guest this week has gone through. Hey, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Andrew Roberts is a guy that prides himself on mental toughness, uh, grit, and resilience, and he talks a lot about that. Um, and and it's all all stems from i guess his his upbringing you know and uh he 
yeah, he just had, you know, a, a pretty uh, tough upbringing, um, you know, with his family. Um, his folks got divorced when they were quite young. And um, he, for some reason, was the, the one that had the, the toughness in him. And that is sort of something which goes throughout his life, you know, and he's had some really, really, really dark and deep and tough moments uh, to deal with throughout his career and his life. Um, and, you know, we obviously discuss these with him uh, in the chat. Um, and then one of the other things that we, we would talk about, which Craig and I have a big interest in, is uh, war. You know, for, for we, we, it's not like we love it, you know, and we think <laughs> we have to have it. But <laughs> it's, just, it's just an interesting thing that, uh, you know, obviously there's been a lot of over the times. Hey, Craig? Yeah, and, and what the, the mindset is while you're sitting in the barracks, the boredom that people have to deal with, um, it's sort of a big roller coaster, isn't it, of, of emotions. Like, you know, the one second your base has been bombed, people have been hurt, and the next minute you have to kind of get on with things because things still have to, uh, to go on and, and you, you can't sit around worrying about things all the time. And, and then you go into this phase of being totally bored uh, and it's a really strange sort of a um, environment to be in. That's and that's part of what is what the fascination is, I guess, because it's just something that we can't really like ever ever begin to imagine because we haven't been there. Um, but you know, as you said, Andy's been through some you know incredibly tough times, and yeah, like you said, it's one of the most moving conversations we've had. I guess um, you know seeing a man that is undoubtedly tough uh he physically mentally uh he's quite an imposing man but to see him so vulnerable about his experience of being a victim of domestic violence it was very very harrowing and very touching for both of us and we're just so grateful to andy for being so vulnerable and open about his experiences, because I think it's something that is unfortunately very common, uh, not only in the general public, but also in the um, military world, hey Gareth? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a chat that actually, like you said, Craig, it, it impacted us so deeply. We actually, for almost like the whole rest of the day after we had recorded the podcast, we had we were like audioing, messaging each other back and forth, just going, wow, I still can't believe this, you know. And it's almost <clears throat> like you also said, it's it's actually the opposite story to kind of what you think, you know, might might, it might be. That you have this strong, tough, uh, big, uh, almost overwhelming man, um, you know, who you would never think would ever have any kind of issues in life, uh, especially when it came to like, you know, having physical someone having physical sort of power over you and then he for 10 years of his life he he suffers terrible mental and physical abuse by his ex-wife and you know the, it's really really sad the story like no one wants to believe him even like authorities that help people uh, hotlines they were like look at you or you know what are you talking about you're a man mm. um, and then dragging you know getting his having his kids dragged into it too you know that was one of the saddest parts of it as well and, and they've been left scarred emotionally you know probably for the rest of their life and these are really really important things that we we need to talk about more um, same as last week's chat you know we need to talk about certain topics that are difficult to talk about more as humans and yeah I mean I don't know is there anything else that you want to add to that Craig no, not really. Uh, like the the big thing is, it's just um, you can really see how brave um, a, a person is in this kind of scenario. Is he's openly and willingly wanting to share the story so that other people don't have to potentially go down that same pathway. And I think that's the, the sort of ultimate form of bravery. And uh, there's not much more to be said because um, he says it so well. And um, and he is a, a really a real gentleman and a brave man and uh, we are we salute him uh, and we look forward to getting into the chat now so let's hear what makes 
Andy Roberts, Ridiculously Human. All right, we're here with Andrew Roberts, uh, a man, a military man, and we're really excited to have a wonderful chat to you tonight. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. It's a real honor and a privilege. Great stuff. How's your uh, day been, and uh, what have you been up to on your Saturday day? Uh, it's been very relaxing. Uh, pretty much nothing all day, so watch a bit of TV and uh, stay at home. Very relaxing. <laughs> Are you not tempted to go to the beach at all, bud? Uh, well, I was, uh, but that's tomorrow. I'll go for a run and go for a swim tomorrow. Yeah, oh, that's cool, man. <laughs> when do you have your next uh, training session? Uh, we'll probably chat about this more, but uh, Andy does uh, some sort of community training sessions. So when is your next one of those? Uh, next one's on Monday, so it's the three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And, and what do you do right. on those sessions? I just run a boot camp. Uh, to and it's open to anyone. Uh, it's free uh, to try and impart my knowledge and the confidence for people to run their own training, be uh, responsible for their own training and well-being. Okay, cool. And then, oh, like, awesome. what sort of training? Like, I mean, because because here in the UK we have this. I think it's called like British Military Fitness, and they have these the, obviously the guys from the military training, guys in the park doing you know, all crazy things, thousands of burpees and <laughs> sprints and whatnot. Is, is, it, is it those sort of, sure. that sort of stuff? It is all that sort of stuff, but uh, it's predominantly body resistance. And this is all part of that. You don't need a gym membership or lots of equipment to look after your own fitness. So you can do it around your backyard uh, in a park with no equipment. So it's body resistance, it's burpees, push-ups, sit-ups, running in the sand. And, and the beach is a great uh, equalizer for everyone. Yeah, yeah, tell me about true. it, but geez, you, need, <laughs> yeah, you, you get tired in about 20 meters when that sand is thick, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, things that are easy on grass uh, become a little bit more difficult in the sand. Yeah. yeah. So where do you do that? And is it near where, because you, you were saying now a moment ago before the chat that you're looking out over the water, over the beach uh, and, and the sea. Uh, is it near to where you live? Do you just head down to the beach there? Absolutely. It's about two blocks from where I live. I live uh, overlooking the ocean at Service Paradise, and I do it down on the main beach there uh, at the end of Cavill Avenue, uh, where oh, it's beauty. central for most people, easy to get to, and a great place to promote what we're doing, get a lot of walk buyers to go, oh, what are you up to, and how much does it cost, and explain that, and when we say it's free, it's like I'm in. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You must get some like decent numbers down to your thing, because I guess, because it must be great training, and also, you know, you're not charging anything. Absolutely. So uh, in summertime, I'll get anywhere between 60 and 80 people. Uh, wow. In winter, when it gets a bit colder, uh, then the numbers drop to about 10 to 20. <laughs> wow. 60 and those to are the 80. people that you like. Yes. Yeah, that's a lot. Eh? Yes. Well, and those are the diehards in the winter. Oh, absolutely. And they're the people who like, have been uh, coming for the last seven years now. I've been doing it. So. Oh, awesome. Wow. And you've never like thought of you know ever charging people? It's just your kind of... Cool way of giving yeah, back. Yeah, no, ne never thought of charging. That's That would uh, be counterproductive to what I'm trying to sell, which is you don't need to spend thousands of dollars uh, or be made to feel incompetent or, uh, or ignorant to some basic fundamentals of life. So Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Like, I, lo I love the, you know, the fact that you, you know, you're spreading the, the wisdom of like, okay, you don't need to go and pay $50 or however much it costs in Australia to join a gym and work out inside. And, you know, you, you, it's just cool because like, you can do it and is acceptable for everyone, accessible, sorry, for everyone, which means there's a kind of like no excuse. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of those, but yeah, there's, there's no real excuses why you can't come. Um, and most people uh, regularly appear, you know, it's very seldom that people are, uh, don't come so yeah it's a, it's it's a great um great for me i really enjoy it keeps me fit and i can give something back and be part of the community that uh you know i really love yeah yeah, yeah. now are you are you somewhat of a stereotypical drill sergeant on everybody or is it like pretty relaxed oh uh, yes i am so that would be uh, the molding that i um put myself in in the military uh my career spanning the 30 years has pretty predominantly been uh, like a drill sergeant, uh, that regimental focus, so yes. So uh, no, there's no uh, screaming and abusing down there, it's words of encouragement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think the, I think the army words of encouragement are a bit different to the general public's words of encouragement. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah no, you're right, but um, you know, soldiers are different to civilians, and so we use the uh, tone-appropriate 
uh, <laughs> descriptors on the beach. <laughs> but how, how do people do people like dig it? Do people enjoy it? And they're like they they kind of like that motivation that that kind of different form of motivation that you bring. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people over the years have quit their gyms and personal trainers, even when they've had membership, and you know, predominantly just come to uh, what I offer. Uh, and many of those people now are, are very competent, confident to run those classes when I'm unable to be there as well. So, uh, for example, if I'm away for uh, like a Wednesday, uh, some of the other team that uh, have been coming for a while will step in, run really good warm ups, run the activity, the, the cool down session. No injuries, so that, you know that's the whole point of it. Yeah, 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 cool. But but you seem like a solid bloke still. Like, I mean, are you hitting any weights these days, or is this just muscle memory from back in the day? Uh, yeah, so two parts. Uh, I used to hit the gym uh, fairly heavily, and uh, as as well as all the other activity. I don't do any weights anymore. Uh, it's all body resistance. Wow. Uh, so. Again, you need to have a gym on hand and you need to commit to going to a building to do something, whereas doing your own thing in a park or the beach, is, it's a lot more free and easy. You don't have to really plan too hard for that. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the weights now, uh, not so much anymore. Not so much, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like, uh, what, what, is a, what is a normal sort of session involved? Like, in what, I know they're like morning sessions, evening sessions. Evening sessions, 6 p.m. in the uh, in the evening. Yeah, and and like again, so there's no excuses why people can't make 6 p.m. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's morning. People, there's people are, that are not that morning thinking people. about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so like how do like you know what is it like an hour session and what what sort of drills do you normally go through? Yeah, generally it's an hour session. So we'll get people there. We'll make sure that they're all fit and ready to undertake the training. So we ask for injuries, illnesses. Because that can, uh, you know, really affect the person and, and maybe put a liability on me I don't want uh, if they're injured. Uh, then we'll go through uh, some um, appropriate warm-ups for the session I'm going to run. And generally, we'll, I'll have a focus, general maintenance. I'll do an either abdominal workout, upper body, lower body, or cardio. So we'll do the appropriate warm-ups, do about seven to eight minutes of those. And then we'll get into a demonstration of what we're doing, run the session, and then do a cool down. So, for example, the Wednesday just gone, we did an upper body. It was just push ups after push ups after upper body after upper body. <laughs> uh, and it was a pretty exhausting session. So, um, <laughs> I yeah. can imagine, but yes. Have, have you got a mix of boys and girls? Absolutely. So, we have all, all uh, walks of life men, women. We have some of the uh, people bring their kids cool. Uh, oh, cool. as well, which I'm happy for them just to run around and, and, and muck around and do what they can in. Um, and we'll have everyone for all nationalities. So we have students that come over. We have people who are retired. We have uh, quite a good nucleus of uh, over 50s wow. as well. And so oh, there's awesome. some fittest people there. Yeah, really, wow. really fit, smart. And do you like kind so of... So we have all... Sorry, but do, do you like break them up into groups like based on like their fitness levels and abilities and stuff? Or is it just everyone goes and supports each other? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, so we have one golden rule. There's no egos at uh, my training sessions apart from mine. Uh, and that way, people are competing against the person inside themselves, not the person next to them, which can uh, put people in a compromising position. They can overextend their physical abilities. They can make you feel uh, you know, not worthy and therefore uh, won't come back to training. So we have that golden rule that you come and you work to your potential no one else's. And anyone that you're there to impress is yourself. No one else. You should have been. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like you, you, you know, you're obviously a man that uh, discusses a lot about mindset and resilience and we'll come to that stuff. But uh, I take it you throw in a little bit of that before, your, before and after your training sessions as well? Yeah, we always talk uh, about mental toughness and rigor. Uh, most of the challenges that we uh, experience in life and where we potentially don't come on top is because we haven't mentally prepared ourselves. So the training sessions we talk about mental toughness so they can push beyond their perceived limitations mm -hmm. uh, to achieve new expectations. So. Wow. Yeah, that's flippant. Now, man, I can only, I, how does it sort of like correlate to sessions that you guys used to do back in the day in the army? Is it, you know, like the intensity, I guess it's nowhere sort of near, is it? Uh, no, absolutely it is. Uh, oh, I've been, for the last seven years, totally impressed and surprised, uh, sometimes bewildered about the commitment 
dedication and just, uh, you know, absolute uh, grinding that some of these people that I train uh, give into a session. And some of the sessions I run would have soldiers gasping and these people stump up and they keep going. And I cool. couldn't, be, couldn't be prouder of these people who some of them have come from no fitness, couldn't do a push-up to the last an upper body session now yeah, where we wow. were in excess of 500 reps push-ups wow, wow. that's is and and you must have like seen some amazing sort of transformations in terms of maybe people's personalities and mindsets you know never mind their bodies but like you know going through all your sessions over the years i have as a, as a uh, gentleman here michael uh, and i won't mention the last name but uh he came he was quite uh, overweight uh, no fitness whatsoever would more likely spend most of the session walking than uh, running or jogging, could barely do a push-up, uh, had yeah, just no strength. And uh, he's a fantastic example and motivator of, uh, you know, and, and it's due to him, mind you, uh, running the session is easy. The commitment he gives is the hard part. But, you know, can run a whole session now, you know, when he's not the oh. first, not the second or the fifth guy, but he doesn't stop. Yeah, and you know that's an achievement. You don't have to be first. You just have to give your best effort, and he does. And his development over the last several years has been amazing. You know, absolutely yeah. amazing. That's so wow. cool, man. Yeah. For me, that's, that's so why cool, I do it. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. No, it, he's it, just it, one, just one example. One yeah. out of many, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's just so cool to see how. Um, when people stick to something, whatever it is, that things happen, things change, and, and you can just see it happening along the way. And you, it must be a really awesome feeling to be sort of part of that and like be a sort of a facilitator uh, to something that's, you know, free but life changing. Like, I mean, what a good combination, I reckon. So, um, well, yeah, sorry, you were going to say? Absolutely. You know, all these things are achievable, obtainable, but sometimes people just need that uh, assistance with the first step. And it gets them going, you know, and there's no price you can put on that. And it doesn't need to be a price. Either. This is fundamentally human. We just need that mentoring and someone there to guide us when we're not sure at the start. Yeah. So, yeah. so how do you like encourage a person like that, you know, in their first session, you know, because, you know, I mean, you can't be like, brr, 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 like, go do this, go do this. There's obviously, <laughs> I guess, another side of you that really sort of gets them motivated to, to do the session. Well, that's where we had the discussion up front, the ground rule. There's no ego. You're not here to impress anyone. You do what you physically can uh, within your uh, limitations. If you want to try and push it or uh, push the boundaries, I'm happy to help. But it'll come. You know, and we give that absolute encouragement up front, particularly the people who are more overweight or challenged. But that's that honest conversation up front that I don't expect anything from them that they're not willing to give. And they know that's okay. And there's no shame, yeah. no judgment. Which is, you know, one of those uh, things when we have judgment in our day-to-day -day life, uh, in personal, professional, is what, in most cases, holds us back. Is what, uh, you know, creates fear in our life. That judgment, mm. you know, and we don't need to do that. We just there should be support. Totally. Buddy. Yeah, fully. I I feel like um, that judgment must happen a lot at normal gyms as well. I'd imagine like it's so cool that you're putting ground rules down in a way because. Um, like you say, it it's, can be a massive barrier for some people to to actually show up um, to some places just purely because of that big ego. And if you're setting that, that feeling up every time, uh, it must be a real safe space for people. And I think it's really that's really valuable. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've spent my fair share of time in the gyms, and I'm not a small guy by any yeah. description, but uh, I've been to the gym where I felt inadequate against some guys who just look like monsters, you know, and yeah. it's that uh, people trying to obtain or achieve a, a goal in their life that can have that goal crushed by people around them, rightly or wrongly or uh, innocently, that they feel inadequate. Uh, we're mm. trying to remove that inadequacy, that feeling of inadequacy in, in the GC community boot camp. Uh, you're, cool. you're there for you. Yeah, that's cool. I, I think I'm going to have to get, uh, you know, I... I work in surface paradise and uh you know i think there's going to be no excuse for me not to come and join you for a <laughs> session at some stage soon even though it makes me a little nervous <laughs> you'll be fine absolutely fine and, and generally great friends just struck up from there like i'm going out after this tonight to watch the fireworks uh with a, a whole group of people who i met 
uh, over the course of the years now, and we're going to have some drinks and some good food and watch the fireworks again. A group oh, of awesome. people that I didn't know beforehand that were now friends. That's so yeah, cool, man. So, cool. so, so, like, did you literally just go, right, I'm going to start this, like, seven years ago or however many years ago, and, you know, just get a couple of buddies to come along? Or, or were you always doing it? How did it actually start off? Uh, it started off with I was doing my own training and I was doing a combination of uh, gym and body resistance and cardio. So I was doing about six hours of training a day. Uh, got into amazing shape and people were like, wow, you know, what are you doing? What drugs are you taking? All that sort of stuff, which none, of course. Yeah. Uh, and they said, well, you know, how do I get like that? And so I started to write what's called beer coaster programs. So I just get a beer coaster because I was generally at the bar and I'd write down a series of training activities for seven days <laughs> and they said oh i travel a lot i wouldn't be able to do oh, this and i said well i train on weekends or in the afternoons down the park using the outdoor space and you're happy to come and join so it just grew from that oh, wow. and then i started to uh, advertise uh, proactively about community boot camp and word of mouth so it just took off from there just uh, helping people on a one-on-one -on -one basis to form a small group to you know provide that uh, initial platform so they can do it in a safe environment with someone who's experienced and qualified uh, and how to run uh, basic training, uh, body resistance, and that they could replicate themselves. Yeah, wow. that's ripping awesome, man. <laughs> you, you hear about boot camp a lot, but I think this is like, uh, this is the real McCoy, I reckon. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like, uh, we. We used to use a lot of equipment, truck tires, and we used to have that whole military <laughs> focus. Uh, we try to remove the equipment. That way, people don't think, oh, well, I can't do that because I don't have a tire. Yeah. We just got a bench, got uh, some sand, you've got, you know, a gutter you can use. Yeah. yeah. Anything, anything that's around your natural environment, at home or in a local park or down the beach. Yes. No, that's cool. brilliant. Well, uh, you know, that's this is definitely the kind of man, um, Andy, that you appear to be. Uh, to give this chat a little bit of context, um, my brother, who also lives on the Gold Coast, he um, came home uh, one day and he phoned me up and he said, wow, he just listened to a really inspirational chat by, by someone that was in the military for uh, th over 30 years. And he was like just telling me the story and I was just like, wow, that sounds super interesting. And um, he... he <laughs> Uh, I told you the story. He did. He, he sort of went on about this amazing military-grade laser that you had with you, and he was like obsessed with this <laughs> thing. But anyway, like that, that was his one thing that he really enjoyed. But yeah, it, it just the, the the discussion was around mental toughness, uh, rigor, resilience, etc. And um, and I said, no, oh, that this sounds like a person I'd love to have a chat to. And and here we are now. So so it's really cool, and um, we're really grateful to to have you on. And we look forward to like really getting into like what you know all these things mean, mental toughness, what it's like to be in the army, and 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 that kind of thing. So take us back a little bit to the to the younger you, and uh, and tell us a little bit about the, your youth and before you were a military man. And, uh, and where things sort of uh, kicked off uh, in your life. Sure. So uh, I was born in 1970, August 1970, in a little town called Yass. Uh, my parents divorced early in my life, and I generally had a nondescript sort of uh, childhood until the age of 17 when I joined the Army. I did regular things, you know, I went to school, surfed, uh, played rugby league. Uh, got a job in a sawmill uh, in a place called Tumbarumba, which is uh, up in our Alpine region. And then I joined the army and my brother joined the army and I thought, wow, uh, that's really cool. I hadn't thought of it before that. I hadn't really thought about what I wanted to do. I just left school at 16 to go into the family business, which was transport. Anyway, I went and watched my brother's march out on the 8th of February, 1988. And I marched into the same institution on the 10th of February, 1988, two days <laughs> later. And it commenced my own career into uh, soldiering. But yeah, nothing really untoward in my youth. It's just that regular sort of guy growing up. And uh, as a as a rugby league player, like uh, what position did you play? I used to play wing or centre. I was pretty quick in my day. Yeah. So I had a lot of speed and a good step. You know, I could generally uh, step around three sixty pretty quick. So that was my forte. And and, and did you ever like uh, try our rugby union at all? I used to play rugby union in the initial years in the army. Yeah. 
which is a more of a, rec- a recognised sport in the in the military, rugby union as opposed to rugby league. Okay. Uh, never grew a massive taste for it. I used to like enjoy playing sevens because a big oh, yeah. field with yeah. seven people and my speed, it would generally I could get the, the try line pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, I remember like growing up, it was always like, we're, you know, watching the Tri Nations and the rugby union and like. Um, you know, we always used to like want to smash the Aussies. And, you know, um, I don't think it's changed, has it? No, no, it definitely hasn't changed, but and it's like it's still the same case. You know what I mean? But uh, but yeah, it was weird because we never played rugby uh, rugby league in South Africa. Or well, they had they have a team and like some guys played it, but it never took off. It's just like it's like a sort yeah. of very well, similar, minor sport in South Africa. Similarly, I never I never knew about rugby union in my youth either. Yeah, which is why yeah. I probably didn't play it. It just wasn't you, in our area, you know, or a prominent sport. Yeah, and and, and uh, Australian uh, or Aussie rules uh, footy. Did you did you ever play a bit of that? No, <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of Aussie rules. <laughs> yeah. It was more of a Victorian sport. I grew up in uh, New South Wales and country yeah. New South Wales, where Aussie rules was unheard of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and and, and so, but, but you know what? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, what? No, you go. I was just going to say, like, you know. You were saying like when you're in South Africa, you think, oh, we want to smash the Aussies and and what have you. But in reality, like rugby union is such a small sport here. It's, it's incredible that they actually can put together such a good side. You know, like most people are are playing, you know, rugby league or Aussie rules. Like, and there's like a small minority of people that are left that that play rugby union. And uh, the fact that they're still one of the best sides in the world is is pretty amazing, actually. Oh, absolutely. There is obviously a, there is a real penchant for rugby union. It's a specialised sport, I think, in Australia. I think a lot of our colleges and universities uh, put a lot of effort and time into developing that code. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you're right. They are a really good side. They're struggling a little bit at the moment from yesterday's, yeah. but we'll get back there for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but we won't we won't talk about Aussie sports at the moment. Like uh, it's kind of like uh, cricket. Feel, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it feels like don't go there. It feels like the sort of um, tides have switched. You know what I mean? Like uh, South Africa used to be in your guys' shoes, and now you guys are taking the limelight from us, which we're quite happy about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, something we always pride ourselves on. It's just not a good place to be at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny because um, I've lived in London since I was like uh, 18 and always used to like watch Aussie rules on TV and or, and rugby and everything as well. And like used to kind of like hate the Aussies. Like, like, it's, it's funny how South Africans hate the Aussies. But then when I first came here, I moved in with this bunch of Aussies and like they were the coolest guys ever. And um, <laughs> ever since that day, like I've played Aussie rules and love Aussies. And um, it's just like, it's been like this massive rivalry when it comes to sports, you know, and they always, always beat me for so many years at cricket, at rugby, whatever. <laughs> and um, and I, it was tough, you know what I mean? When you're playing Aussie rules and you have like, 80 Aussie guys are training and they, they give you grief, you know, all the time. <laughs> um, and then, like, eventually the tides turned one day, but all the guys had left London. So I was like, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> I can't have my payback. <laughs> uh, funny stuff. That's funny, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, just just wanted to touch a bit on, like, your folks getting divorced and that. Because, I mean, that's, that's also quite a, a big event in, in people's lives. And, like, you know, I know... For me, my, it was it was like, you know, a tough situation. Um, did it did it impact you at all? Was it like a tough breakup, a messy one? What, uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I was uh, blessed initially with the uh, the gift of ignorance. Mm. So my mum was uh, mentally ill and uh, went to a hospital to get treatment. I wasn't aware that she was mentally ill. It was part of the breakdown from marriage breaking up. And so we lived with my father for. Oh, a good four or five months and didn't know where mum was, never saw mum. Hmm. And uh, I didn't think anything of it. I suppose it, it is the gift of ignorance as a, as a, as a young person. And then uh, mum come back into our life hospital one day when she'd been released and she was going to start her own life uh, in a different city. And again, it was like, hi mum, bye mum, I'm playing at school sort of thing. But then when the formalities of the divorce came through in the hearings, and I remember quite clearly to this day, having to go to a room uh, with this complete stranger and make that life-changing decision about who I wanted to go with, mm. mum or dad. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah, terrible. Yeah, it was uh, one of those points in my life that I'll never forget because it was painful uh, and very emotional, of course. And uh, there was no right answer. Yeah. Whatever decision you made. Yeah, you can't win. Uh, you, you're going to hurt someone's. You're going to crush someone's feelings. And I remember I'd never seen my dad emotional in my whole young life then. But we were at McDonald's in Wynyard in Sydney, and he'd just taken us out for lunch. Because he still had custody at that stage. And he asked what we'd said, and we told him, and you know, he broke down in tears there in McDonald's at oh the table. Oh, my God. Yeah, so it did change me after that. Life was a little bit different after that. Wow, we bad. Sure. How old were you at this stage? I was seven. Oh, wow. It's such a tough decision like that. They, what, is that like common in Australia, that the kids have to make a sort of decision like that? Well, I don't know if it was back then or not. Um, it certainly isn't now. I know from my own experiences in family law court, uh, generally they won't put that on the child at such a young age. When they get to a more ripe age of 13 or so, 14, more yeah. aware and more able to make decisions. But at a younger age, and I don't speak from authority there, but I, I thought, no, at that young age, they're too young to be put in that position. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Totally. Oh, it's so tough. And, and did you, Good Lord. so it sounds like you said you went with your mom. Um, did you still see your dad, like, you know, like every second weekend or something like that? Was it that set up? Bingo, prize for you every second weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. how was mom at this stage? Was she like, you know, she had dealt with some serious mental issues and um, tough times. Had she sort of come out of hospital then and, and was was doing a bit better? Like, do you remember her feeling well and, and doing well at that age? Uh, there was always uh, demons, I think, always mm. uh, a shadow over her from then on. It was, she was never the same woman that I knew prior. She moved on with life but never went back to work after that. I don't know if she was mm. mentally capable to go back to work. Wow. wow. Um, and so we, were, we had a bit of a pauper's uh, upbringing. We had no money and we, everything was seconds and all, you know, which is mm. not an issue. We never knew better, so that was fine. But. Yeah, she never fully recovered from that. But my right. grandparents, who are now both passed away, and my uncle, uh, were fantastic in their support to her. And we lived in the same town, city, in some cases, house, mm. where they offered her support. And we were raised by them equally as well. When my mum was in that bad space or was struggling, then there was other people that could assist in that with us as well. Sure. Yeah. And do you have a relationship with, with mum and dad now? Or? Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. Great. Probably better than ever now, oh. uh, particularly after, um, you know, and we'll probably get to that part about the domestic violence in my second marriage. But now that I'm out of the army, I have time to actually go visit them as well. It's great. Wow. It's a better relationship than I've ever had. Yeah, That's wow. great. So, so what, did your mum probably. suffer from some sort of depression or something? Is that what it was? Uh, yes, uh, my understanding, and I don't think even have ever gone into it in great detail, but... There's a lot of harassment by my father's side of the family to my mum, and she had a mental breakdown. Wow. So, so yeah, so she and the marriage failed after that, and then my dad uh, went into a new relationship. So it all stems around that whole thing there, but she wow. never recovered from it. it hit it pretty hard. Wow. Yeah, it's it's so sad how like so many families go through these things, and I mean, you know, we're going to get onto your story as well, and it's it's it's. Yeah, I don't know. It's really tough, you know, like to to kind of grow up like that as a kid, um, as well as for a mom and stuff. You know, she she must have felt kind of really bad that she wasn't maybe able to be herself and stuff for you. Um, and it's it's also quite interesting, I think, like how many people actually suffer from this and are brought up from it. Um, but maybe it's not necessarily spoken about. Uh, oh, I think you're right. There, there is behind closed doors. There, there must be a lot of, in many households a lot of uh, depression, a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. a lot of sorrow. Yeah. Well, luckily, we had a very supporting family. A, a mother who loved both her sons to death. Sort of thing. Uh, she even now she speaks. So I can love nothing more in, in this world than you two boys, and I'm so proud of. Yeah. So yeah. that was never yeah. a, an issue. Is that my mum's love? It was her, I suppose, ability to cope cope with the situation yeah. and yeah. make a new start from nothing as well, which was always difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you think that that um, on some deeper level, the fact that you talk about mental toughness and resilience has any sort of link to that? Or is that something that sort of grew from something else? That's a good question. 
A really good question. I've always been pretty resilient throughout my whole youth. Most things don't phase me at all. I go through pretty difficult situations mm. and come out still functional, still focused and still performing at a high level. Um, whether that shaped or defined my character initial age, I'd have to say yes. You know, if I dealt with that and, and the trauma around that, the emotional baggage around that, I never really experienced the difficulties that other people would. I know my brother experienced a lot of difficulties. He was very upset when my mum left. Mm. I remember that, that time I spoke when she came to the school and said, hey, I'm going to come get you boys. Uh, I said, great to see you, mum, and I ran up and went playing, whereas my brother wouldn't let her go and was in tears. So mm. maybe I'm just a heartless, cold bastard, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's um, the, the rigours of those sort of challenges in life have never really uh, been able to upset my whole approach to life yeah, on, yeah, on, many, on yeah. many situations. For sure. Wow. Did, did you feel like um, you took a sort of sort of more dominant role in the sort of family kind of structure and setup then when it was just you, your mom and your brother? Like, were you like a, not a fatherly figure, but like the, you know, the main guy there then? Uh, I think it was equally shared with my brother, yep. although he had his own interest, but I think I was probably there for my mum. Mm. I understood her pain. I knew that, and you know, we used to spend a lot of quality time together when my brother was out. Then I was there naturally. Um, my my brother's older, of course. Okay. Mm. Uh, but I wouldn't say I drove the family. I think it was more my grandfather and my uncle. Wow. Cool man. Strong, strong male figures that oh, you no, had fantastic. at the time. Yeah. Absolutely, absolute uh, gentlemen, fantastic human beings. It's oh, nice to cool. have those. Um, ro- it's so important, and and to have good role models uh, for young, well, for boys and girls, but, you know, as, as a boy, to have good, strong um, role models, uh, whether it's your dad or grandfather or something like that. So it's it's great to have that fondness that, that you can speak with such fondness of them. You know, that's really special, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, and they're fantastic. They've been uh, a cornerstone in, in who I am today. Yeah, yeah. Personality, yeah. person I am. You know what's quite interesting, and this is just a complete observation based on my mates that are pretty much mostly Aussies. Um, that all every single one of them speaks so um, joyfully and like proudly of their grandparents, like they had really awesome relationships with their grandparents, mm. um, which is so cool, you know. And um, I don't know, it's just like an observation that. Uh, you know, that's obviously quite a big part of like the family structure in, in Australia. This is uh, something I discussed with my two boys at the moment about our generations and how we've changed for whatever reasons. But you look at the generation that they come from in the era, they were different times. They yeah. were, uh, there's more um, a line of, of decency uh, as mm. the, the social norm. Mm. Sure, there's always bad eggs and there was terrible things that were done, but uh, on the whole, the people from that generation, uh, social values uh, were the most important thing, and that extended mm. to the family. They're the people who I model myself on. Yeah, so I cool. speak very fondly because they're always very fair, uh, very approachable. And my both my uncle and my grandfather were very strict. Yeah, there was no nonsense. <laughs> but uh, when it was time to uh, to go and do things, fishing, golf, go to the beach. Uh, they were always there, always very caring and, and very engaging. So, you know, absolutely fond memories of them. Yeah, that's for yeah, sure. That's great. And, and do you think, yeah. like, that sort of has changed now with the sort of later generations? Is it is it something you notice because obviously you've got kids and stuff? I think it has. You know, I get around a fair bit in, in public and I see the lack of general courtesy and manners, uh, the arrogance. But my son and my younger son and I were discussing this very point. The influences that they have are so much greater than mm. what my grandparents had, which was maybe in the heyday a wireless to maybe a TV, whereas they have social media. They mm. have a different set of social and moral values mm. and compass to what uh, I did, to what you did, to what my grandparents did. And that's I- no one's fault. I think that's just they're modelled by the society and society's become much more accepting uh, and so they play in the available space we give them. They're not, they're not really held as accountable these days as they were, as my grandparents were when they were raised by their parents, etc. Mm. Yeah. 
It's interesting. I wonder, I'm just thinking off the top of my head now as well, but I, like military conscription was was sort of standard at one stage. Am I right? And um, uh, and so, is it? Yeah. Sorry, carry on. No, we didn't. We didn't generally conscript. Was, general was it? Was it never voluntary? I, was it always voluntary? I thought it was okay. I just thought that um, you know, so it does seem like there was a more of a chivalrous sort of a time. I don't know if it's like a romantic idea, but it certainly seems that way. That there was this sort of fairness and this this idea of like um, respect or something like that. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how how social media has that influence on that, but there does seem to be a change in that. Or is it that we're just getting older? Like I always wonder if it's, if it's just that, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you, and, you, and you make a very good uh, point as well. I'm not sure. I'm very uh, hooked up with the romanticism of the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, from that generation, just a common decency through the whole vein of society. Whether I now perceive that differently from my own exposure, or whether I'm just getting past the use date, a use by date, and that <laughs> I'm now impeding or impinging upon the younger people's creativity and, and opportunities. And I don't like it. I'm not sure, but um, you know, just, just see they, they just view life but so much differently than what I do yeah. to what you know to what I think is socially acceptable. Yeah. And that's not everyone. Let's not let's not have a no, sure. much. That's not everyone. That's a, probably a very small minority. But in my in my travels, there seems to be a, a, a more reoccurring theme of that than it used to be twenty years ago when I was a child. And I, I try to be objective about that. Did we do that? Did we? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those things, and I, I I have to honestly say, no, we didn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, at the same frequency I see these days, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, but I, I definitely agree with that. Um, f- and I also think it's like cultural and stuff like that too. Like, because in South Africa, I think, s- first of all, schooling is very strict. Or why? Okay, I'm talking, okay, when we were at school, it was pretty strict. <laughs> I think it's, it's loosened up a bit now. Back um, in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you like, you would stand up and you would, a teacher would walk into the class and you go, good morning, sir, good morning, ma'am. Um, you'd always say, you have to say good morning, sir, good morning, man. If you walk past them, there was, there We'd was respect. Canes. Yeah, yeah, you would get, but, but, yeah. but that, that, that's a South African thing as well with, when it comes to that, or was at least. And then when I look at it here in the UK, uh, but I promise you, you want to sort of grab these kids and shake them and go, you know what? You seriously need to sort of, um, sort yourself out because they 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 are terrible. <laughs> Honestly, they're terrible, and it's not just it's not just um, um, it, 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 sorry. It also happens in the schools though. There's like teachers have no rights, right? So like you can't do whatever. So the kids just talk to them like um, you know however they want, and it just co- kind of manifests itself from such a uh, a young age and. I think it's twofold. It's it's that it, it, the fact that ki- the teachers have no rights. You know, there's no discipline allowed, and it's just this kind of like you know these kids all are part of this community that then just carries on and carries on of like you know all being the same. And um, it's quite it's quite concerning, I must say, just at how what a lack of respect there is, um, in my opinion, uh, for kids of the younger generation right now. I think it's a tough job being a teacher now. Uh, yeah. I would not like to be a teacher at all. And uh, my son, my older son, is a, a high school teacher. And while he doesn't talk a lot about his job, uh, I know that he is challenged with children in the school today. But you know, you say you want to shake these people, but whose standards are they assessed by? Are we opposing our standards on them yeah. now, or if we judge them by their own generation yeah. standards? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're generational tomorrow. That's the golden question now. We find it unacceptable in their generation. They, they don't. Yeah. Wow. You know, and that's one thing that's part of it. It's like, uh, you know, I had a discussion with my son the other day. And he goes, I said, you know, you need to learn how to speak respectfully to people. They're your elders. And his response was, I don't really care about their age. I'll, I'll speak of how I feel and respect yeah. So that's the sort of... <laughs> Yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. And then there's a point to that as well, you know, like you got to you can't you can't just um respect someone for the fact mere fact that they're older than you, you know, on some level it's sure. true that if someone's um kind to you, then I'll be kind back to you kind of thing, you know. So there 
It so, is. It is a slightly more, yeah, like you said earlier. It's, it's, it is fairly complicated question about are we imposing our um, romanticized ideas of how things should be? You know. <laughs> Well, I was hoping that would just be the baseline for yeah. generation, not let's just remove the baseline. <laughs> I yeah. suppose is the, epiphany, is the epiphany I had. It was like, wow, okay, so let's just take that whole part out now and it's oh. anarchy. <laughs> yeah. but, but you know what? I also think like sometimes we become a bit PC with these things, you know, and we, we should, these sort of values should still exist, you know, and we should go, you know what? You should flip and be polite and respectful and stuff because we we have been for centuries and up until maybe the last 20 years it maybe seems to have changed a bit um so are we just becoming a bit too accepting of things and not you know remembering that these things are pretty good for society to sort of exist properly well that's my point before i think we have become accepting of it and we've allowed them to continue uh, their, their progress towards that end of the scale when myself, I sit up the other end of the scale. Mm. And, you know, some of my people who know me and my family think, oh, that's because you're military training. Well, it's not. It's got <laughs> nothing to do with the military. Yeah. This is common decency and courtesy in, in the world, in life. Uh, and that should shape or form how we have uh, engagements with other people. And, you know, if we want to be treated like with decency and respect, we need to give that as well. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, I think it's... That's their norm now, and then all those influences, rightly or wrongly, the social side of the social media, the yeah. easiness of life as they have it now, that sort of lack of acceptance of responsibility, it's never my fault. Mm. They all yeah, that's true. That. Yeah. Now, you were, when you were just basically a, a teenage boy, that's when you started your journey uh, at uh, the training, the, the Army Recruit Training Center at, at Kapuka, is that correct? Um, and tell us a little bit about, yeah, the first, when you walked in and, and what, what was life like in those first year or two as a tra trainee? Yeah, it was, uh, well, the first uh, 12 months, two years in the Army were some of the most fantastic times in my life. I remember I spent three months at a place called Kapuka, so it's our recruit training battalion. I arrived at 8.30 8 at night. Uh, it was quite cool. At street lights, get off the bus, with these military police giving us the right act about drugs, stabbing implements, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> with a bunch of uh, 40, uh, 40 strangers, yeah. essentially. And being, being goat herded down to a building where I would then <laughs> spend the next three months of my life. And very fearful, very scary. And my first, my first instance of my, uh, a guy called Dean Robinson, recruit Dean Robinson, became a mate of mine. He was my, uh, next door neighbour, so we had four door room, so two one side of the petition, two the other, and him and I on one side, and we had to stand outside the room in our what's called a bed space, so bed space order. So he'd taken in his head that uh, his name had to appear on the other side of the room, so he, uh, of the hallway. So we stood on the other side, and the recruit <laughs> instructor, my section commander, come down and he goes, "What the hell are you doing?" Oh, I'm going to stand here, sir, which is wrong because it's a corporal. <laughs> anyway, in, 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 in some really choice words, which I won't use on your podcast, <laughs> I actually tore this guy to pieces <laughs> right from the get-go about, you know, what an idiot he was. <laughs> they're in a basic wall because their names are on each, either side of the door. Gave him five minutes' worth of a tongue lashing and then turned to me and basically said to me, and you're, you're screwed as well. <laughs> Because you'll sleep in near him. <laughs> so, that's my first five minutes oh, in the army. Yeah. Oh my god, what have I done? Oh my god, by association, so, collateral. <laughs> the story's a lot better when it's tied with the full expletives, but um, <laughs> that's the general gist. So anyway, I, I got over that, but no, I had a fantastic time at Kapuka. Three months. I love the routine of the place. We worked sixteen hours a day. We knew when we woke up what we had to do in the first fifteen minutes. Get out of bed. Uh, make your bed with your with your roommate, race down there in your thongs about running and slipping, uh, have a shave with a cutthroat razor so you come away looking like Freddy Krueger had messed your face oh. up, <laughs> even if you need to shave or not at 17 because that's when I joined. Race back there, get dressed into your uh, starch uniform, which you'd spent two hours a night before. Uh, quickly clean your weapon and do that all in 15 minutes and be standing wow. outside your room wow. to then uh, get to breakfast. 
Now, that was an ordeal in itself because you never crack that 15 minutes for the first six or seven weeks. You're <laughs> always late. You never make the deadline. And there's just punishment after that. Oh, and wow, punishment, man. Punishment and punishment until <laughs> – well, it promotes working together as a team, efficiency in what you do, you know, having a plan of how you'll tackle it, all those lessons. Awesome. And you finally get those. But, uh, yeah, there's many a morning there. I managed to get to the steps of the, uh, the mess and do an about turn and march back without anything hitting my – mouth because you had to be back in by a certain time. Oh, I'm just anticipated. So it was great though. I loved it. Yes. Fantastic oh, training. Great training, you know, uh, great friendships were made. But uh, coming out there forged, ready for battle, you know, like uh, hardcore. Th- three months of just grueling work, but discipline, routine. It was a great experience. I loved it. Yes. I was sad to leave actually. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, like – what what's your um how quickly can you get ready these days is it like still 15 minutes or are you a bit more lenient on yourself <laughs> a couple of minutes i can shave in about 15 20 seconds it's just wow. pretty much <laughs> <laughs> off comes the uh, the stubble and the into a pair of clothes you know a, sh- a quick shower after that for like you know 30 seconds to a minute yeah. and then in uh, dried into you know within five or six minutes i'm ready to go no problems wow <laughs> that's a classic but you'd, you'd hate to know me. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, I'm, I don't mind like taking a long time to get ready in the mornings. I'm like, cool. <laughs> I was trying to ease into the day. <laughs> Youth of today, man. Yeah, that's true. But... <laughs> well, you know, they have that ability. They have that, uh, that luxury. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's so cool. I guess you must have picked up some amazing skills. Like you said, like, I like what you were saying about being efficient with your time. And it, it didn't, that, that translates into life in general, I guess. It's like, you know, you can do it quicker. You can do it smarter. You can do it in a in a more efficient manner. And I guess you you sort of taken that into your everyday life now, or in business life, and that kind of thing as well. Absolutely, one of the key skills that you learn uh, throughout every aspect of your training in the army is personal organisation, your, your personal administration, and your self reliance. You know, we work in teams, and teams is the fundamental cornerstone of the military of any military. But that self-reliance that you know how to get yourself over the line, to get things ready, to plan your day, to work through a problem and, and uh, put the pieces together in the appropriate timeline that you're given. You know, unrealistic as that may seem initially, that's a, that's a wonderful skill. I use it every day of my life and everything I do, both at home and at work. That might come off as appearing a little bit robotic and uh, rigid at times, but I'm never late. Yeah, 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 there you go. But I, I often think like whoever sort of like came up with the army or, uh, you know, the idea around it, like um, was a super, super smart like person, you know, because like you said, they put in this this sort of amazing structure and way of learning. And, you know, it's just brilliant um, in terms of how it helps you later on in life, um, at least from being organized or an organized point of view. Well, when I first joined, it was rote learning. We did everything uh, re- repetitively, 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 and it becomes habits, muscle memory. Mm. These days, and rightly so, we need a bit more creativity in there that you need to have that uh, ability to uh, agilely shift to a new scenario and be a bit dynamic. But the rote still has its place because it teaches you structure and organisation. And that's a, you know, a lot of kids don't have that there. So all over the place to how to organize their life, particularly kids in high school. We've, you know, I've got this sporting activity I, I contribute to and these extracurricular activities here and I've got homework I need to do and I've got exams I need to study for and I've got chores at home and how do I fit all that in? And, you know, that basic timeline and reverse engineering your timeline with, uh, you know, the things that are absolutely necessary with the things that are nice to have or nice mm. to do prioritizing and organizing the available time you have because there's only it's 24 hours in a day but it's a great skill yeah wow more people should be learning that stuff at school hey like it's just such important life skills to to learn not just not just the facts but how how to structure your life a little bit like you say that especially the youngsters they've got a lot to do like there's a lot to fit in and i think i'm still struggling with that like i wish i'd learned that as a, at a young age to do that efficiently and well like it's such a good skill to have oh my word and there's obviously children that do that uh, naturally yeah. but yeah uh, i know that in some cases a lot of kids don't have that there's no pattern to their life 
it's totally chaos. It's random about what they do on any given day. I, yeah. I, I, I often think like um, excluding, say, like uh, making people go to war and stuff like that, that a year in the army or a similar sort of environment would be great for like almost any kid leaving high school, you know, just to straighten them up a little bit, teach them some cool rules, uh, make some mates, uh, learn about helping people and, and everything else that you do learn. Like, do, would, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, say, if everyone just had to do a year of that after school? Oh, yeah, I agree. Mandatory service. I know a lot of the friends I've worked with in other armies, particularly in uh, Europe, they have uh, conscription, mandatory mm. service. <clears throat> That's fantastic. I think uh, the, the, those basic values they learn early uh, are great uh, stepping stones for their future life. Uh, for what they want to do after that, even if it's just going to professional studies to get a career after that. I agree. Uh, I think one to two years of mandatory service. Very difficult to achieve, of course, because there's a massive mm. amount of budgetary requirements. But, mm. yeah, the, the skill sets they would get for those are, are fantastic. You know, they learn a little bit of confidence and uh, self-esteem, uh, personal organisational skills, uh, teamwork, respect, uh, 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 a moral compass that has to be absolutely calibrated to the highest level which is what army is mm. you know we in the army our our branding our necessity to have so absolute faith of our society in what we do is paramount but i'm sorry our moral compass is, is really trimmed mm. but those things i think there's no negatives there yeah yeah uh, all of our like uh, probably seven to ten years uh, before us, everyone went to the army in South Africa, um, and so we kind of just missed out on that one. But um, everyone that you speak to, uh, or not everyone, lots of people that you speak to, also say one of the other things is that it's it's you kind of humbled because you, you put on the same playing field, and you're it gets a lot of the ego out of the way um, early on. And I think that's another thing is like just to learn that. You can ask for help. You need to work as a team. You know all those kind of things, uh, like you said, but also just leveling the. It's you're all on level pegging when you go in there. No one, you know, except the, obviously the officers and whatever else. But when you walk in there as a youngster, we're all the same now, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I agree. You know, I spent six years as a recruit instructor, doing exactly what I went through. Uh, not too long after I actually left there, and you're exactly right. That's exactly what it does. There is no one better than the other, uh, and it does uh, teach you that uh, that teamwork, that sense of belonging, and you know the ability to ask for help. Oh, I agree with you 100. percent I think it'd be a good thing, very hard practically to achieve, but the benefits would be wonderful. You know, yeah. for those particularly those kids uh, who struggle to get to that sort of level of understanding in their own life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, especially also like for. I don't know, kids that, that come from broken families or, or whatever it is, you know, like violence in their families, like that's, you know, that that sort of environment um, can help them too, I guess. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, like I said, it's an, it would be amazing, but um, from a financial point of view and also, um, you know, trying to get everyone sort of agreeing to that would be basically impossible. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what was the kind of like the next step from that, you know, um, what was, what, what, how did your journey carry on after those three months? What, what happened? So I went in to, uh, get a trade in the army. So I ended up being like a, um, a storeman. I wasn't really sure what I was doing then. So I was allocated a storeman to work in a warehouse, you know, receding, issuing, lots of stuff. But I didn't really, uh, embrace that as the best job, but I soon found a penchant for training, uh, both physical and other types of training. And so I spent the majority of my time running physical training activities, remedial, uh, running parades, that sort of thing. And then not long after that, going down and becoming a recruit instructor at the same place, so Kaput. And I did that uh, all up over my career for six years. That was my next journey. That's the thing that I really enjoyed doing, that and being out in the field. So practically applying what you think any other soldier would do out in the field, you know, in the operational context of uh, an army in the field. 
and I sort of focused on those things, not so much trade. I sort of left that behind. Uh, and is that including like all sorts of things, the operational stuff like um, weapons training, like strategic stuff? Or what what kind of what kind of stuff were you were you teaching? So your level of exposure and understanding uh, commensurate with your rank. So the junior level, you carry a rifle, you carry your house on your back, and you <laughs> go out through the uh, woods, the jungle, and you will execute the missions that you're given for the tactical requirements for the strategic plan. As you get higher up in the levels, that strategic awareness and operational awareness expand, and so your involvement and your impact on, on those missions increases as well so from a young soldier you walk around and basically when you shoot the gun you know interdict with the enemy kill the bad guys you know. corporal you start leading uh, you know 10 men and women under your command you're responsible for their life their life hmm. uh, getting them home safely achieving the mission then you go the next step above that you're a guy who looks after 30 and you know supports a young officer looking after 30 and then it exponentially gets uh, more and more responsibility but, you know, the fundamentals of soldiering are the same. You need to have good weapon skills and a, in, a, in a variety of weapons, good tactical uh, knowledge about how to stay alive in the battlefield, how to keep other people alive in the battlefield, and what are the things that can uh, can put you at risk on the battlefield, and how to achieve your outcomes for your missions. Wow. And, um, That's very broad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's, uh, like when you say carry your, your sort of, um, your life on your back like how much are these guys sort of carrying around in their training and stuff because you hear crazy stories like I don't know 25, 40 true. kgs like <laughs> no, and, then, and then more as well so wow. when I first started we had small packs and you put in there a ration pack a spare battery for a radio um, maybe two sets of clothes, a change of clothes and some you know small some socks jocks uh, very very basic equipment and that was alright it was heavy enough back then but uh our packs and equipment have got more scientific these days and more ergonomic so and bigger mm. the problem with having a big <laughs> uh, you have a big suitcase you go on holidays you fill the thing yeah you have a small suitcase you go on holidays you fill the thing well yeah. we're carrying more and more weight and as we become technologically advanced our requirement to carry more ancillary equipment to support that technology has increased so uh -huh. you're carrying more equipment and yeah I, when i was uh, my last Operation, just my body armor and, and ancillary equipment, less pack that I carried was 30, 37 kilos of extra weight. What? Now, that's about a pack. So, what? some of these guys wow. are carrying 40, 50 kilos of equipment around. Jeez. Jeez. Maybe that's more. Crazy. You know, if, you, if you fill the pack up, maybe 60. What? That's, that's crazy. crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And it's the really good training. Spare ammunition, <laughs> spare water, rations, you know, a radio all the other equipment that we have, technology we have, then a pack will give spare clothes, more spare uh, bullets, more spare rations, uh, you know, uh, an entrenching tool, maybe a machete, et cetera, et cetera. It all adds up very – and armour, what your body armour yeah. as well. Yeah, wow. <clears throat> wow. Adds up. Yeah, that's crazy. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, – yeah, that's the basic ability – physically and mentally to be able to do that and maybe patrol for, you know, 15, 20 Ks, 25 Ks in a day or do that continuously for six, eight, 12 months and be proficient at yeah. all times and alert uh, in, in that environment. Wow. That's a basic, basic job of every soldier regardless of rank. Yeah. Wow. That's, and, it's intense. I wanted yeah. to ask you about that. Do, do, you, do you guys like go into, say, the bush and learn how to – survive and spend a few maybe weeks in the when you're training like on a on a camp or i don't know what you call it like on a, a training camp or an exercise yeah that's, that's the word clearly i'm not military there uh, <laughs> on an exercise and and then you'd have to like survive and i don't know what, what would an exercise look like generally okay so i think what you're talking about is like you know living off the land and surviving without support that's a more specialized skill that we used to entertain a fair bit, and we still do a little bit of that here and there, but that's not the basics because if we get to that stage, we've lost all hope, we've lost a whole unit or you know, a whole group of people. Yeah, yeah. An exercise generally is you go out with a specific uh, plan or tactical scenario where you're going to live in the land and respond to that, and so it may have you moving over a, 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 a 
an area for a day, two days, seven or ten days, or maybe you're stationary and you, you're digging in and you know, like you, you see the movies, dig a pit, jump in it, all that sort of stuff. So the wow. technical scenario will dictate what you do, but yeah, generally you go and exercise and you'll practice all those sort of scenarios that you could experience in the real thing to, again, uh, get into a routine, make it all uh, second nature, that muscle memory. So then if, you, if it happens in the real situation, you've been there before, you know what that looks yeah. like, and you can just get straight into it. You're wow. not trying to figure out how to solve the problem in the middle of a firefight yeah. or yeah. you know a, a, a terrible exposure to weather or any other event. Yeah. Wow. And, and at, at what point did you uh, go to, like, actually go to war and stuff like that how many years after you sort of started what so i joined in uh, what we call the great peace so post vietnam mm -hmm. so when vietnam finished in the 70s there was nothing really happening on australia's radar for quite a while so i joined in 88 yeah and i didn't go to any sort of theater until 2000 okay. so 12 years wow. And I was lucky. I went to what well, was East Timor, but I went to the first war Australia was involved in since Vietnam. I went there after 12 years of service, and I was a senior NCO, a sergeant. I know a lot of the mentors that I looked up to, uh, discharged out of the army of 25, 30 years, uh, have never gone, uh, or you wow. know, had, they were still in it. It had been 22 years for them. Wow. So, uh, that was yeah. That was our first great refresher on. Uh, wow, as a as a formed force, how we go into war, what we do, and there'll be a lot of lessons that we've, we've forgotten, of course. Yeah. There have been small engagements, Cambodia, Somalia, Rwanda, uh, some of the UN operations, but they were very small scale and not a big force. But yeah, East Timor was our first big uh, wake up of, hey, you know, you're still an army and the world isn't peaceful. And so yeah. that, we've got a lot of lessons from that. And it's pretty much been at a crazy tempo since that for the Australian Army and Australian Defence Force since Timor. Wow. So you guys didn't go to the first Iraq war then in, was it 91 or something? We had a small contribution, special forces and some air force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's no secret. Um, it was a very small scale. Yeah. It wasn't a, it wasn't a massive contingent per se, uh, like a, a formed force. Like we say, we sent to Afghanistan and Iraq in the in the more preceding years now. Yeah. And and can you just take us through what it's like to to be in like war? Like I mean, you know, what what happens? What's the setup? What's the mindset? Um, all these sort of things. So I think to try and explain what it's like to be in a war is what you see in all the movies, and then it's all that, and it's none of it. Okay. Mm. At the same time, I'll explain that. So you can go there to an operational area where there is you know, kinetic activity, you know, people trying to kill each other, and nothing happens for weeks and months and months. It's a routine. You go out, you run your patrols, you carry out your missions, and nothing ever happens. But then mm. when, you're not, when you're least expecting it, then something happens, and it can be mm. crazy for a week or two weeks or, you know, or it could be, you know, for the whole time you're there, it's very busy. So there's a routine or a structure to every day that we do. And then you'll go out and do your missions and you'll either, you know, be vehicle mounted or you'll walk out and you'll do those activities. Or if you're in logistics installation, you run through your normal logistic day and nothing ever changes. And that can be the, the undoing because you become numb to it. It becomes so boring and... You know, that's when mistakes happen. So wow. you know, most of the time we go, it's trying to stay frosty and it's trying to stay focused on the job, regardless of how boring it may become, so that when it does happen, you're ready. But it's hard to describe because it's, it can be a normal day, as if you're back here on, on a large base or installation. But then it can all go crazy when, you know, for example, what they call indirect fire, they fire rockets and mortars into the base and there we go, Jeez. scaring everywhere. Wow. Yeah, so... It's 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 not an easy question to answer. Yeah, um, that's what I'm saying. You know, when you see combat, I know um, a lot of the guys that, I, that I've worked with have been hip deep in that sort of firefight where it's just been crazy. Are they going to come out? You know, the IEDs. Mm. You know, around every corner is another IED, <clears throat> and that's crazy for them. And some of them had extended tours where it's like there's just no relent to that. And others wow. never heard a shot fired, or you know. Wow. It, 
one contact, uh, which I was speaking to a guy the other day where I was, uh, he had two contacts in his uh, eight-month tour. So it's almost wow. nothing. Wow. So I guess that complacency must be a real uh, issue to, to try and uh, curb. Is that the role of like your commanding officers or the people of higher rank to keep that morale up and to keep to keep the systems and your routines, I would imagine, really, really strict. Is that how does that work? How do you keep how do you keep people in, sort of semi engaged? Absolutely, uh, everyone has a role to play. So the commanding officer at the higher levels is obviously worried about welfare and morale of his whole force, and that filters down to you know our junior NCOs, the people who command ten men at the lowest level. He has to be intimately concerned he or she, about the welfare and morale of that small team. And so they actively fight to uh, remove that complacency every time they go out. Because the time you are complacent is the time you'll get nipped. Mm. The sergeant, the platoon commander, the uh, company commander, all them play a role in making sure that we try and stamp out that complacency and keep people focused on the mission. Everyone has a job, even peers, because, you know, leadership's not... The, uh, the, the purview of just those in command. Leadership uh, can be or reside with anyone. You know, mm. peer, peer leadership, you might be that guy in that team uh, of the same rank who has an affinity for that leadership and charisma that uh, can affect and influence the other people in that team. So mm. everyone has a role to play in that complacency, in that, in that team and staying focused on the job, however numbing or grinding it becomes. Mm. So, so okay. So you, you know, you obviously you've been to East Timor and you've been to, I think you said Afghanistan a few times as well. Um, what, what, what's the kind of difference in the setups there? And you know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to like, yeah, um, I, I, because you, like you said, it, it's hard for us as normal people to, um, you know, we just see the movies and what goes on. And I know you've just kind of explained there that like it can get quite boring and everything, but like. Surely there, there are the times, and I don't know if you have been involved in those times where you're like, right, it's full on, we're in it now for you know a few weeks, and, and what, what is it like when that happens, if you have been in those situations? I mean, the, well, when you come under fire, it's uh, initially it's like, uh, I'm not sure what's happening there, what's going on, you know? It's, you hear this cracking or you know, this disturbance, like, it takes a moment to realize that wow. that's, that's someone firing at you. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, and then you respond very quickly, of course, once the penny drops, yeah. uh, you find <laughs> up very quickly. Yeah. 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 So I've had, I've been shot at uh, a couple of times, uh, a few times, um, generally from over a fence line. Uh, so it's just been in passing. Uh, indirect fire is when they actually fire rockets and mortars into your position. And yeah, that's horrific because then you're just laying on the ground waiting for something to happen. Wow. Jeez. And hopefully not near you, you know, because they're going to land somewhere. So that's that's terrible. When, when you go into that, it, it disrupts everything. And that's if their plan to do that is to disrupt everything because there's a whole heap of processes you need to go through to account for people, confirm that, uh, you know, there's no unexplained ordinance. Uh, try and return the base to normality is very difficult. Mm. People are shake, shooken up by that and there's still that real threat that it could happen in another hour another six hours, another day, another week. And, you know, you've seen the news yourself. Uh, the amount of soldiers have been hurt by um, mm. indirect fire and rockets, you know, fired into bases. Uh, when that happens, the world changes, as you know. it. Mm. And you, but your training, the exercises we do, as we spoke earlier, are there to prepare you for that. So you have these responses. And before we go to theatre, we do a lot of intense training to prepare us for the scenarios that we may face. That's not to say that when it happens, you're like, it's cool, I've got this covered, I remember doing this in our lead-up training. It's not the case, everyone responds differently. But most people respond in a positive way because they're more worried about embarrassing themselves and letting their mate down. So it keeps them moving, keeps them active. That's wow. generally the big focus. I know that's mine is, uh, to never so I, uh, let my mate down and, and by my inaction or ability to do something or respond in the correct way, endanger another person, prefer that just to kill me first. Hmm. Wow. Um, you know, by, by result of my negligence or inability to act, kill one of my mates. So that, I think most soldiers have that at their core. 
that's what drives them on and it has them respond in those situations, plus great training we do throughout our whole career leading up to that. Wow. Yeah, you, so, can't, you can't even just imagine the emo- kind of the emotions you're going from a little bit of boredom to like extreme, like fearful. I, I just, I can't imagine how you kind of, the, the, two, three days later, you go back to patrols and you're like, okay, here we are again, like crown, Groundhog Day, but like two or three days ago, whatever's just happened. You know what I mean? Like, it, I, how, how do you, what is the mental talk? Um, do you have like debriefing? Like, what, what happens after an event like that? Absolutely. We have debriefings. Uh, so, you, after you come back from every activity or incident, uh, you'll do a debrief. You can learn a lot from what you did and what you didn't do and talk through the issues and make sure everyone's still mentally adjusted, mentally right, able to keep going so that no one's hurt. You know, one of the mm-hmm. major factors we have is those unseen uh, unseen injuries, you know, the mental damage that, are, that people are uh, experienced from you know, the nasty business of war. But uh, so we do that. The other one is just good mateship, you know, some dark mm-hmm. humour uh, mm-hmm. and that sense of belonging and purpose. You know, the, the, the investment in the, the reason you're there needs to be 100%. And that will get you through that roller coaster ride of emotions, you know, from, you know, nothing happening, sick of being here because it's just boring to, you know, the world's turned upside down. And we have wounded or dead soldiers coming back through, and, you know, you've got to deal with that as well. And it, it could be you, it could have been a guy you knew. Um, yeah, that, that sense of uh, belonging, that good mateship, mm-hmm. they're, the, they're the fundamentals. That's what is the pivot point. Or and, getting through it, particularly unscathed. Mm. What's it like when, like, you know, one of your close mates is hit or injured or, I don't know, you know, killed? Is It must just be, must sort of kind of bring everyone down a fair bit and and closer together, Absolutely. I can imagine. I haven't known anyone personally like a, a mate who's been wounded or killed. I know a few of my mates who have. And I've seen the soldiers come back through and, and unfortunately taking part in uh, transporting uh, one of our fallen back home uh, from that. And it, uh, it affects everyone, even if they're not known, because mm. it's an Australian yeah. soldier. You know? mm. And that extends out to the coalition as well. I've attended many ramp ceremonies in Afghanistan for um, coalition soldiers, Canadian, American, uh, who had fallen in the fight as well. Mm. And it's tough. It's it's terrible times, you know. There are people here giving up their freedom uh, to try and promote freedom and liberty in the world, and they pay the ultimate sacrifice for that. Everyone handles it in their in their own way. What we are better at doing now is talking about that, those feelings, and making sure people are all right, as opposed to you know, really stiff up a lip, just get on with it. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you'll be right. That's that's the old way we were. Now it's more yeah. about ensuring that people are uh, understanding that it's all right to feel bad about that. It's all right to have a, a, a doubts and that by talking about it, we can do something going forward that they feel more comfortable continuing on, not mm. hiding uh, that shame or that uh, sort of pain away, perceived shame, their perceived shame. Uh, I'm weak, oh, I shouldn't be here, oh, I can't go on, it couldn't be me. So there's real mm. conversations that we have about those, because it is. It's a, you know, it's just a terrible situation to be in, and, and everyone will handle it differently. Absolutely. Mm. Can imagine talking about uh, and you're talking about uh, doing good in the world, and and that. What is the perception of people like the civilians back home, friends and family, of what you do? Like I could imagine it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um. Generally, uh, I find in Australia people are very uh, accepting and, and grateful or thankful for what we do. Uh, they don't know exactly what we do over there. Mm. And, they don't, and nor should they. They don't need to. That's not, they didn't sign up to be in the Army. But yeah. we're generally accepted in, the, in, in Australia very warmly, uh, very good. generously by our, our society. Absolutely. I've never found too many people who are anti-defence. I've never really have any real confrontations with people who want to get in my face about it. So uh, it, generally, it's pretty good. Uh, it's That's good. It's nice to serve uh, this nation 
and the people will be positive about it. You don't, you don't get thanked, and we're not about thanks. You don't need to be thanked for my service, or we don't need to be thanked for our service. That's not why you join. It's nice when they do it, but we just know that we're held in high regard by our people, and that's what makes service yeah. uh, meaningful. For sure. And you said, like, you know, it, people don't need to know what, uh, you know, you guys do. Do you think that maybe we do need to know a little bit more about what you do? Because then we can understand, like, sort of your, like a lot of guys come back with, uh, you know, say PTSD or, you know, other issues and maybe struggle to reintegrate into society. Like, wouldn't it be better if we did know a little bit more so we could kind of maybe help and nurture you and, and whatnot in a way? Or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, it's it's nice to have a general awareness of, you know, the, the trials or rigors of what combat can do and what, what how that affects individuals, our people, our, our sons and daughters, our mums and dads, etc. The nastiness of war and specifically some of the terrible ordeals they go through, I don't think would make people's lives more colourful. Uh, uh, so in that respect, I don't think we need to go into minute detail about the horrors of it. A general awareness uh, of what they do, yes, but you know, you could turn the coin and say, do we know exactly all the horrors that our police officers face? Yeah. You know, mm. Or our firemen, you know, uh, you know, you talk about a police officer turning up to a roadside yeah. accident where there's mm. seven people dead in, in the yeah. body's torn apart or, uh, you know, a fireman trying to sit through the remains with this, of a house with this four people inside. Yeah. We know, we know that generally that's what happens. We don't need to be described in detail. Yeah, sure, cool. they need to know there is challenges overseas and then people are risking their lives, but they're well trained for that and equipped, et cetera, et cetera. But the detail thinks it doesn't value add to their lives and it may make them worry unnecessarily. Yeah. 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 It's, we don't. We don't want. To, we don't want to set up a charity case. You know. We know what we're in for. It's they're professional, and we we sign up for that, and we voluntarily put ourselves in that position. Yeah. I think Australian people know that it's not in, when in those circumstances a nice job, and yeah. that's why they appreciate that someone they're willing to go do it on their behalf. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um. So. <sighs> Just shifting the the chat on just a little bit. I mean, now you you know now you um, are doing a lot of talking around um, resilience, but there's actually something that that stems from, uh, which is once again something I guess that people are not talking enough about, but probably does impact a lot of people. And you know, it, this is around physical abuse um, by like partners and things like that, and it's actually something that you have suffered from yourself um and it's almost like people that don't necessarily think that it happens the other way you know they think oh this sort of strong military guy you know if if something ever did happen it would be kind of him doing it you know but in your case it was the other way around uh, can you just maybe take us like through this journey and and what what sort of happened on that side of things Sure. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's probably the darkest decade of my life. So my second marriage, uh, I was in a relationship where there was lots of abuse, domestic violence, basically. And uh, I found myself very isolated from everything in my life. So my ex-wife managed to alienate me from my family, my brother, my son at the time, uh, all my friends. And, and it was purely over this need to control me and my job. So the army played a part in that no fault of the army, it's about some of those hard choices and sacrifices you make as part of the job, having to be mm. away a lot of the time, uh, never being reliable uh, in the family life because you're, you're serving the nation. Yeah. And that built up a really high level of resentment which turned to mm. violence. And so for wow. a decade, my ex-wife would uh, regularly beat the crap out of me, you know, mm. with objects with her fists, with her feet, and you spit on me, uh, just absolute mental abuse, you know, um, you're an effing loser, you amount to nothing, you should just go kill yourself. Uh, and it continued, and, and the use of knives, and that would continue yeah. to some horrific levels, you know. Uh, and she knew the environment at the time. Uh, so if I wouldn't do what she said, um, 
she would uh, make the threats, I'm going to tell your boss, your commanding officer, that you raped me and what? beat the crap out of me and that you molested your children. What? So they're the sort. that's the sort of level that she would go to. And it was horrifying because I lived in a constant state of threat and fear that Jeez. in the society, and, and I think you can agree, the society would believe her. Yeah. The police would believe her. And then I would be guilty of those accusations yes. until I could prove my innocence. And even if I could, uh, there would still be doubt in people's minds. So my whole yeah. credibility, my character, my name is destroyed forever. And I lived in grave fear of that. I, and, and that the violence become a secondary thing com- compared to that until I managed to uh, trick her into admitting the nonsense on a recording. Wow. Uh, and wow. I spoke to my, one of my bosses about it. So that was the sort of level I went to where for de- a decade it, it was just terrible. And, you know, I often thought about uh, ending it. <laughs> Not so much to take my life and end my life, but to stop the pain. So I suppose the hardest part of all that was the lack of support I had from society, the lack of understanding I had from society. And I'll give some examples there. Uh, on two occasions I went to police in the later years where the violence had escalated to you know, attempted stabbings and, uh, you know, full-on violence. And on two occasions, the police just said to me, really? Look at you, mate. Really? Yes. Crazy. Crazy. Uh, you know, I spoke to certain people about it who were powerless to do anything about that. Uh, I rang up a hotline uh, for domestic violence and they said, oh, we can't help you, you're a male. What? Oh, and my God. And, well, there was no mechanisms in place for this. And many of the conversations you heard, uh, particularly in those mid-years, uh, women would just demonise men as these white bashers who were one second away from flying into a rage and doing something ridiculous. And when I would engage in those conversations to try and promote this awareness, they would say, and, and it was a common thing here, not widespread, but common one, so, we must have done something to deserve that. Oh, my and God. that was the sort of belief. And it really got you down because you had a sense of hopelessness. And the whole oh. time I'm watching my children traumatised and often beaten themselves by their mother oh, my God. to get back at me. Um, you know. So I tried to engage uh, in conversations to try and promote this awareness that uh, the, the victims of domestic violence are exactly that, the victims of domestic violence. And it's not restricted to a gender and in the recent years most of the literature the narrative and, and a segment running channel nine the other day it still focuses women as the true victims and uh i agree women are victims but so are men and so are children mm. Mm. Uh, predominantly and so when dave morrison the old chief of army started the white ribbon campaign i saw i didn't engage in that at all i said i refused to take part in the white ribbon not because i believe disbelieved in white ribbon but it was only it was only uh restricted to a gender women only and when i tried to raise awareness of that i was basically told no no we're not doing that uh, that was very hurtful because i knew the trauma that my children had gone through mm. and so i spoke to one of my bosses about it and he then subsequently in a next posting worked for the current chief of army angus campbell and they decided to actually address the issue because in out of conversations in my research, uh, so many men are affected by domestic violence on both the physical and more uh, destructively, the emotional mental level. Hmm. Yeah. And there was nothing being done about that. It wasn't being addressed. And so uh, they started a campaign uh, and, and then a video on uh, talking about domestic violence as an issue in society, not a female issue in society. Mm. Uh, that was very therapeutic. But it's, we've got a long way to go yet still. Um, there's still so many people who still think that the only people affected by domestic violence are women. And it's terrible because it's life-destroying. You know, I would Jeez. hate to think, if you did a survey, how many young men or how many men take their own life from that. And I know lots wow. of guys in the Army who have suffered domestic violence, who just won't talk about it or too embarrassed to talk about it. Mm. There is no hope. There is no one there to help them step through that. Wow. And we hear about the hopelessness of what women feel like in that. A guy now has the added stigma of he's a man. Mm. That shouldn't be. So yes. I'm very passionate about it, not because I'm a man, 
as I'm a victim of domestic violence, and so are my children, and so is my current wife, and so is my mum and dad and my brother. They all suffered wow. because I was alienated and ostracised by my family from a decade. Wow. I couldn't have any relationship. So it's a real serious issue, and wow. I'm happy to speak very passionately about it because it's something that our society needs to get on board with. And as I said just the other day, Channel 9, uh, it's still a woman issue, apparently. Wow. Yeah. wow. It, it must be so hurtful for you to see that, you know, like, uh, we, you know, living that and then and then seeing it um, being excluded from that um, from that framework uh, that it's only woman. I can only imagine how, how tough that must be for you. Um, yeah. It was it was terrible. And, uh, you know, you really got that stage when it was like that, like, what the hell am I doing here? What, what, how do I escape this? Uh, and I, my reasons were all the wrong ones. I stayed for my children, which I thought were the right ones. So I did was subject them to more cases or more instances of that violence by staying. Uh, but, you know, I spoke to a couple of my bosses in the hope to try and have them understand uh, what I was going through and to protect myself about from those allegations, because those allegations about me raping her and molesting my children would be life-stopping. Yeah. You know, and I needed them to know what I was going through until I could secure uh, sort of the evidence to support that that was all bullshit, so to speak. Mm. And I didn't go into all the full details with them, but I, when this video was released and my old boss, um, who's now very high up in the Army Senate, he rang me up and he said he was just absolutely devastated by it. Um, yeah. Couldn't believe it. He, he felt so terrible because he'd failed to take any action at all to do anything about it even though he knew it was happening. Mm. The Army now, Defence now, is a long way forward in making this a real issue to deal with at every level, uh, to make sure that our people, our men and women, uh, aren't being hurt, uh, lives destroyed by this domestic violence, and that they have avenues that they can speak to people about this to help to get out of that cycle. Cheaper. And as the video says, silence is the willing accomplice. By saying and doing nothing, uh, you just condoning that that behaviour. Wow. So can, sorry, just yeah. I mean, we were actually chatting about this before, and like sort of just making up our own stories, like Craig and I. Um, but uh, like, what happens when your ex-wife like comes and hits you and is trying to stab you? And how, how are you reacting? Uh, purely defensive. So I never hit her once in the decade. No, I made that clear. I never once retaliated. Probably the reason, because if I started, I wouldn't stop. Yeah. Wow. It's such pent up resentment, frustration, hurt, pain, yeah. anger. Name an emotion that's negative, and it would have been there. And so I always refrained. And, and also that if I did, uh, it would be one word to the police officer, then they would believe that I did that to her. Yeah. You know, and uh, that I was the only one that did something. So. I couldn't take the chance that I would be believed on my own merit. Um, so I just lost my train of thought there. No, yeah, we were just... What, what do you, like, yeah. But, but so to tell us, how, how, what, what about the times in between? Like when you'd go to a barbecue and you'd hang out with friends and like how, how did how did things pan out in those scenarios? Sure. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, how do I dealt with those? Oh, gosh, go back when I remember the train yeah, of thought. Yeah. So how do I dealt with those? is purely defensive, protect myself so I don't lose my life, try and protect my children, and try and remove myself from the uh, from the environment to try and calm it down. So I'd often leave the house, uh, I'd one of the streets to three or four in the morning, uh, you know, with a pair of shorts on and a shirt, I'd single it at, you know, minus two or minus three degree temperature, or, you know, wow. walk around and pouring down rain, or try and, you know, until I could get back in the house and she's going to sleep and, wow. You know, destabilize it you know other times it was purely just a run out um, you know just stop being hit have my head stomped on when i was on the ground in the fetal position until she saw like seen some rationale so that's how i managed that and it was always purely you know i have to stay for the kids i just need to get through this i'm so embarrassed to, to say or do anything so it had a lot of power over me as far as barbecues um eventually the, i didn't go to it hmm. didn't do anything didn't have friends because of the embarrassment. Uh, my family is ostracised, so I eventually didn't see my family at all. Um, but yeah, you just you avoid that because it was always an embarrassment. It was always an inflammatory uh, uh, opportunity where I would be 
personally and professionally embarrassed, so he just avoided oh my it. God. So you basically your life stops. Yes. And that's and that's classically that's what people the uh, the uh, orchestrators of domestic violence do. They isolate you from your whole life, all your support mechanisms, so they can control you. Wow. But um, just the uh, yeah. I was watching that silence is the accomplice video, like, you know, before our chat and it's one of those things that you kind of, it's, it's a mix between goosebumps and tears when I was, I was like, wow, this is, this is tragic. Um, one of the people on it, cause you can't actually see the faces and I don't know if it was you or, or, or the other guy said that, you know, the kids try to commit suicide at like seven years old. Um, yeah, that was my son. That was your son. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was in Iraq at the time, uh, and uh, basically, uh, my ex-wife was very resentful that I was off serving my nation, doing what I was trying to do, and that I left her with our children, mm. and basically told her that uh, I, that um, to my son that your dad can't stand you, hates you, Jeez. he's going over there to try and kill himself. He's going to step on a landmine and he won't be coming home. Oh my god. So my son tried to step in front of a car because no. he was so upset, she said. Oh. So it's uh, devastating. She, I remember uh, I rang her one week then and she told me about this and she was in tears and go, You need to do something. Uh, they want to take my, my child off me. Uh, and it, and I knew because she'd told me she'd said all this. And, you know, I was just dumbfounded as to uh, you know, what the mystery was, why you know, why you thought you had the right to have that child, then if you just put the child through this, this trauma, this mental anguish. Um, but that's, that's what she was like, and she still hasn't changed today. You know, my son's just coming to live with me now because she still physically abuses him. And, what? And she's I'm complains of me. Yeah, so that's, that was my son. And, you know, he's mentally scarred still to this day uh, with his children. You know, I have such yeah. terrible vivid memories of, you know, absolute fear of my children. Screaming as the dad's being pummeled, or they're being oh, pummeled. Oh God! Wow. Jesus, man. Um, well, so thank you for sharing that with us. Just you know, just we just want to say that, like, I think this is you know, it's really horrific, and uh, I just think it's so important that people can hear that this is the stuff goes on probably a lot more than people realize. And well, men don't um, report it. Men yeah. just don't report it. You know, and the and the big difference is, uh, you know why men get this uh, demonic sort of uh, label is they generally take it to the end where they'll kill their partner and then kill themselves because they're mentally unbalanced now. They're so destabilised by life and by what they've been uh, afflicted by. Not in all cases, but I, I yeah. can see why they would do that. Uh, having had some of those feelings myself after being pummeled the crap out of uh, you know, that's, but the biggest issue here is you can't stay for your kids. You either need to leave with the kids or leave because all you're doing is you're exposing them to this type of behaviour. Mm. You know, the, the, my children are traumatised as a result of that because I stayed for the right reason, which was all the wrong reason. So, you know, for your listeners, if you feel like you're doing the right thing by staying and copying and hiding and, you know, you're just traumatising the children by being there because it's just, uh, you know, you're the excuse for that person, male or female, to lash out and your children will witness it all. Oh. Jeez, and, and, and how did you eventually get out of that relationship? Well, you know, as the video says, I didn't. I never broke the cycle. I was in it to death, one way or the other. Um, she left. She mm. left. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so she wow. for someone else. For someone else so, no uh, way. Which God. It didn't, didn't, didn't phase me at all. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't any love left by then, let me say. Yeah, wow. Cheapest, but and, and what about your like your recovery? Like, how, how what has the recovery been for you? I never really recovered from it. Uh, it wasn't until I made the video that I sort of confronted the issue. I sort of just packed it all in. No one ever knew what was happening, really. I sort of hit it. Uh, I'd go to work with a black eye or broken nose and I'd make an excuse. Um, I was performing at the height of my career, I was performing at the best of my ability, and no one knew a thing was happening and see how well I hit it. So I never dealt with it. I just packed it all in and I hit it away. But when I made the video, uh, it unhinged everything. And for a good 12 months after that, I wasn't the same guy. And even now, you know, uh, 
even talking about it or watch the video or whatever, it um, makes me quite unsettled because it makes me relive all those mm. things and all my failings and inability to take action for the right reason. Wow. So I'm still dealing with it, but I've got a really supportive wife, you know, so. That's wow. so good. And, and, and well, you, you, yeah, you go, yeah, go ahead, man. You, you talk about resilience and we mentioned earlier that you, you give some talks on that. I can only imagine that that can can be the only sort of word or I don't know what word you'd use, but for you to be under these massively stressful scenarios on the battlefield, you know, literally, and then you sort of when you come off of that, you come back to this kind of incredible stress like how did you compartmentalize that and i guess is that where i don't know is that where you were just realized you have some kind of crazy resilience or how did you stay focused at work just yeah absolutely so the resilience uh, is a real cornerstone of who i am being able to as you said compartmentalize the things that i can influence the things that i can't or feel that i can't uh and the consequences so my work and my reputation and credibility, particularly for the rank I held in the army, were very important to me. They defined me in a way that my home life couldn't. And so I was proud of that and I wanted to retain mm. uh, that sense of satisfaction in my job and uh, people's, uh, I suppose, uh, good ideas or good thoughts about who I was. So uh, I clung to that to be the best I could and to push through the adversity at home. Uh, was what kept me going. Now, to get through that at home, my focus was my children. You know, my children were everything, and so being able to uh, your video, be there for your, them. Your video just disappeared, bud. Sorry. It's gone the in the light dark. Just, the light just blew. Oh, it did. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's classic, yeah. bud. I was wondering what happened. I was like, please. <laughs> Oh, classic. And the oh, world went classic. dark for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> we can still, yeah. Yeah, light on. yeah well, no, maybe no the, worries, we're going to get some uh, fireworks in the background in a second. That'd be awesome. Just turn the light <laughs> off. and. <laughs> Sorry, just go again. What was that? Yeah. Oh, no, I was just saying it's all the all the better to watch the fireworks. Just le When you leave later on, just leave your computer on there and we'll watch the fireworks <laughs> in yes. the background. Yeah, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's no good for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we got you back. <laughs> yeah, we got you back. Yeah, timing, eh? Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> um, so can, can we, like, talk now, like, about, like, what you're doing? You know, you, you're talking to corporates and I guess to other people too um, about, I guess, what happened to you as well as, you know, your themes are resilience and things around resilience. Um, yeah, just talk about that. That's, sure. uh, yeah, thanks. So a large part of my military career has been about leadership, team building, uh, resilience and mentoring. They're all cornerstones to what we do and how we can do our jobs well and be responsible for such large numbers of people in some really trying adverse conditions. So it's just a natural step of progression as you go through to take ownership of those. And I really enjoy those. And I have a lot of personal experiences or examples I can relate to and with to drive home the point. The recent discussions on resilience are, are exactly that. I was working for during my long service leave prior to discharge. Uh, fought with Craig's brother um, about resilience and I used the platform on my last deployment uh, to drive home some of those challenges that we would face and I tried not to use it so oh, it's a military context because the resilience affects all of us it's not consigned to just uh, someone in say war or a police officer but it's people who are in uh, very busy and, and very um, very high pressure sort of corporate world as well. Mm. It's where you feel that anxiety and stress about the potential for failing, that fear of judgment. And so I used my experience from my last appointment where I was battling a whole heap of problems at home with my ex-wife and allowing me to speak to my children and the work I was doing in Afghanistan, which was mentoring. And all those elements that come into play that would be constantly worrying me you know and what that comes down to is you know our resilience can be unhinged it can be eroded 
and dissolved mm-hmm. by, you know, one catastrophic event or, you know, by a cumulative effect of lots of things, you know, the, the, the death of a thousand cuts, where we just get so fatigued and overworked and worn out that everything fails. And that's what happened in my last deployment. I was there for nearly 11 months and I had all these issues with exposure and injuries and stress and uh, um, crazy hours we were working, you know, 20 plus hours a day, oh, wow. seven days a week, no time off, you know, in a war zone under constant threat wow. from, you know, wow. lack of appropriate food, lack of support, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought I was pretty good. I'd handled everything and anything life could throw at me, particularly 10 years of domestic violence and some pretty nutty stuff. Yeah. And I found myself absolutely exhausted, totally depleted by the end of that deployment. And I just want to use that as an example. Say, hey, it doesn't matter how good you think you are, how good you are, how experienced you are. None of us are immune from the effects of resilience. If we don't talk about it, if we don't constantly challenge ourselves, you can come under the effects of it. And it's very hard to climb back out of the dark pit of despair. Once it's got its teeth into you, it's hard to shake that. And you can be uh, uh, forever damaged by its effects. So... I just spoke about that and I drove home some important lessons and thoughts about how to uh, approach that as both an individual and as an organisation. The adult discussions you need to have in the environment you need to set up that people feel comfortable addressing that and not only addressing it but developing good resilience, good mental resilience uh, in both the people and then resilience in the business. Mm -hmm. So that's where that come from And, and that's all surrounded by those things like teamwork and good leadership as well and mentoring. So that's where that comes from. Uh, plan is to sort of keep promoting and doing some you know, consultancy and sharing my experience with leadership and resilience over the years uh, and putting it into practical terms that people go, wow, you know, that makes sense. Not I've got a degree on the wall and I'm going to give you a whole other profound statements and quotes sure. by dear general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's the resilience component. It's something that's probably underrated and it's all links to my boot camp. Free from judgment. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where people, people are afraid of, that fear, you know, fear of being judged and found wanting and then uh, suffering, you know, some critical self-esteem issues from that that are hard to rebuild. Yeah. And, and the thing is you speak from like such – knowledge yeah. and first-hand experience on that so i can imagine like your 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 son um, must really have the, have an issue with being judged for what happened to him and, and you must have to sort of coach him through that as well absolutely there's some real challenges there uh he sees a counselor uh, he has an, another support person outside of the family environment where he can speak to about those issues in a more confidential manner and uh Probably when he feels free from judgment. You know? yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. I'm, I can be stereotypical and might be a bit difficult to talk to at times. Uh, so yeah. he has another avenue, and that, but that is an ongoing issue for him. He'll need to deal with that and struggle with that for the rest of his life potentially. Yeah. To you know, develop his own resilience about what he feels comfortable with, what he's not, and how to overcome that and, and uh, achieve his goals and succeed. Yeah. Wow. That's. I think that's uh, learning from someone that's been through the stuff that you've been through. I mean, it's uh, uh, you definitely got the right tools to to impart to people. I, I would imagine it can be uh, challenging integrating with civilians again. With not everyone is thinking the way that you're thinking, um, and I guess that's going to be one of the things that uh, that you'll translate into your talks and that and as a coach is that um, finding that bridging that gap, I guess, between where the stuff you've been through and then translating that into a business environment. Um, and that's, I think by the sounds of it, you're doing a good job of it so far. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, it's very difficult. You know, I've dealt with civilians over, you know, over my career, very superficially, uh, not on a intimate day by day basis. So uh, integrating back into society as a civilian, not as a soldier, it was difficult. Uh, my, uh, 10 months, 11 months at the council was uh, very eye-opening, a great experience, a wonderful place to work. But it was very challenging as well. It was so different to anything I'd known. Um, but I met a lot of wonderful people there. So, uh, yeah, it was it was good to see the other side of the fence, and I'm on that side now. So mm. from that I took 
took from that, uh, when I go forward and talk about team building and leadership and resilience, it's important that we speak about the things those people need to hear, not what they want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. If you just want to hear what you want to hear, you may as well just talk to yourself. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Admiring, admiring yourself about how great you are. Yeah. But resilience is about you know, peeling the scab off and seeing what's terrible underneath mm. and addressing those in a mature way as an organisation and as an individual. And individuals have just as much responsibility and resilience as the organisation does. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a bit of a coalition there. You've got to both yeah. be working towards the same end. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was good. I can see where, with resilience, uh, you need to be able to put down a very simple approach to it. None of this scientific jargon, not trying to yeah. bamboozle people or confuse yeah. them with you know, <laughs> philosophies and theories because the average person uh, can't retain that in their life. They need something quick to go to and be able to relate to on a day-by-day yeah. -day basis that makes sense. Totally because that's right. the same with leadership as well. For sure. Totally. Yeah. And And... and are you doing any work with the, the military now as well? Like, are you helping the guys there, like maybe integrate, or is there any stuff going on on that side? There are plenty of people in the Army with great skill sets that do exactly as I do as well. Uh, so I'm not contracting out or doing that, but I am doing some reserve work with the Army again to keep my hand in and to mm. go back to something I know I'm comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, so there will be opportunities for me to still uh, be expressive there and influential in developing the next generation of soldiers right. and out my peers as well with my experiences. So uh, that's very uh, promising uh, as well. I've got a, a toe in both sides, uh, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Good way to do it. Now, Andy, look, we have uh, conscious of time. Uh, we've had a, a good uh, two hours of your time and we, we look we're super appreciative of of your time uh we could just continue this chat for for ages i reckon um but just for our listeners uh we you know if they want to get you to come and talk to them or give you some uh give a, a, a talk to them about resilience and, and what and your story basically how can they get hold of you uh, yes, yeah, so they can just uh look me up on facebook uh so andrew roberts will be a picture of a soldier there and get up Mm -hmm. uh, my email, andrewjroberts70 at gmail.com. Uh, send me an email and uh, we can take it from there. I'd be happy to share my experiences. Uh, that's a real passion of mine. Also, uh, helping people be better uh, better themselves as an individual, but also as an organisation, team building, leadership. Love that. It's fantastic. If I can help someone, uh, I'll do that to the best of my ability, hence the boot camps, all that sort of stuff. Awesome. Cool, man. I really appreciate the opportunity, guys. Yeah, I know. It's, it's been wonderful. No, but so, so yeah, we're just kind of like waiting for one of us to go there. Like Craig, yeah, Craig, yeah. And, I, Craig and I always just, for, for, so just from my side, like, wow, what a chat, man. Like, thank you so much um, for just opening up and talking about uh, these seriously tough moments that you've obviously gone through in your life. Um, first of all, I just want to start at the beginning and say like, what you're doing in terms of the boot camps is amazing. Uh, yeah. Just giving up your time to anybody who wants to join and you're teaching them so many different skills, you know, like, first of all, like you said, uh, you know, no one gets judged. That's such a powerful thing that is so important in this day and age. Um, then you kind of, you, you've built obviously this amazing community around it, you know, people just kind of meeting each other and, um, making friends and, and like egging each other on in the training and stuff like that. And, and you're doing it all just sort of, you know, for, for nothing, just because you're a good bloke and you want to help people, which is seriously amazing. But, um, your, your story is very heartfelt. Um, I, I love, first of all, the fact like you, you, you're very in line with our way of thinking when it comes to sort of morals and ethics and, manners and that sort of stuff and i think that's so important that we we keep that in this day and age and we have people like yourself that are uh, willing to sort of talk about it and to you know to set the example and yeah and then when we were you know talking about the the abuse i i, I can only imagine I, I mean i can't even imagine what it was like um and I can only imagine that it is super hard for you to talk about it and to kind of reminisce and to whatever but please carry on with it because I, I, I think you will 
literally through talking about it help thousands of people that are going through the same thing and i think it's really it's really such a such an important part of you know maybe what like your future looks like cuz cuz the the the, the, the tr- like you said the truth is guys don't want to talk about it especially you know they like they're embarrassed and they don't know what to do and then but it, i think what happens with society is when they notice other people talking openly about it then it becomes I guess in a way more normalized, you know, so, so people will feel more comfortable to do it as well. And yes, I I always see like these army guys like come into businesses and, um, you know, explain to them like about teamwork and structure and support and camaraderie and resilience and stuff. And I can only imagine that, uh, you know, your future is going to be super successful on that front. And, you know, like everything you've gone through, geez, I mean, you, you, like Craig said earlier, you have this crazy tool set um to to help people and and i can just see that that's going to be like a huge success and we we're super pumped um thank you so much for everything it's been great chatting to you and um yeah i really look forward to to meeting you one day and uh, hopefully coming to one of your boot camps in australia and um <laughs> hearing that whistle go like a million times <laughs> so <laughs> thank that's you so fantastic. much fantastic yeah it'd be, gr- it'd be great to catch up with you and it's been a real uh, as i said at the start a real pleasure and a real honor uh, to speak to you here and if anything i've said can inspire uh, or help anyone then absolutely it's been wonderful and worthwhile absolutely yeah definitely. and just briefly from my side and i mean i can't add much there to what gareth said but other than at the end of the day you've been through so much uh but you've got a big smile on your face you like emanate positivity um i love the themes of like teamwork as well i think in this day and age it's such an important aspect and just um finding ways to help one another i think it's just so, so cool and that like like Gareth was saying, it's just kind of you know just from your boot camps, like your whole life has been around that that team effort, and I just think that's a really cool message to take home. And then obviously the like Gareth said, and like you said, it's just something that's the, the darker side of things is it's happening, and um, people just really I think by putting this chat up uh, uh, on our different platforms and stuff is going to be really valuable. Someone will be sitting there watching this and that will speak to directly to them and we won't know who that is maybe ever you know but the the amazing thing is that it will happen and um and for that that that's why we do this and that's also why you do this i guess as well for those people that hear that message so just thanks again from our side and uh, we really look forward to seeing how you go forward with your uh, coaching and um, I will make this pledge to see you on six at six o'clock on one of the evenings, and uh, you can kick my ass uh, on the beach, and I'll lose my ego. Great. Fantastic! That'd be great. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. And and but Thanks I was I, I was just thinking like if all else fails, I think you are going to be a good stunt double for Charlie Sheen. Like I don't know if anyone's ever said that, but I was looking at you the whole chat going. This is Charlie Sheen I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he's just got a big bank account than me. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, funny stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, good stuff. Well, thank, thanks, Andy. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change. Snowy Cape Fold, mountain range. Gotta be quick, so far to go. 